Hey friends, Elisa Childers here. What's it like to go from being a respected voice in the New Age community as a professional astrologer to becoming a born-again Christian? We're going to talk today with Marsha Montenegro about her journey out of the New Age and into Christian apologetics. Welcome to part one of From Astrologer to Apologist. I have a really fascinating guest that I'm excited for you to meet. Her story is utterly fascinating. And uh, But before we bring her on, I want to update you on some things that are happening, some exciting things on the podcast and on the blog and just in the ministry in general. I've been sensing the Lord lead me into more of an area of focusing on what women are digesting. So um, it was brought to my attention, this this book that's crazy popular called Girl, Wash Your Face. So I have uh, bought that book and I know nothing about it. So I'm coming at it completely fresh faced. Ha <laughs> ha. I don't know what it's about. I'm going to read it. Um, all I know is it's crazy popular and that the author is... Um, you know, it, it's there's a Christian element to it. So that's really all I know. So I'm going to read it. I'm going to review it. And you can look for that on the blog, probably, although I may reference it in a podcast. Uh, another cool thing happening, I've sort of hinted on Facebook uh, about a project I'm working on that I can actually go ahead and announce now. So uh, I am writing uh, two and a half chapters for an upcoming apologetics book for moms. And it's called Mama Bear Apologetics, 11 Cultural Lies and How to Keep Your Kids from Swallowing Them. So it's a collaborative effort. Uh, Hillary Ferrer at Mama Bear Apologetics, which if you're not familiar with the Mama Bear Apologetics ministry, Facebook page, website, blog, podcast, all of that stuff, check them out because they're doing some fantastic work. And I'm good friends with them and have uh, sort of been brought on as an honorary Mama Bear on their page. So I, I've been on a couple of their podcasts and uh, actually coming up, Rebecca Valerius of Mama Bear Apologetics is going to be on my podcast talking about how to talk to your kids about hell. So be looking for that one. Uh, But anyway, so Hillary is the general editor of this book, and so she's made it a bit of a collaborative effort. So I'm writing two chapters. uh, One chapter is on progressive Christianity, and the other chapter is on New Age spirituality. We're calling it New Spirituality or New Spiritualism. And so that's actually how I got connected with my guest from today, because I sent her some of my chapter and just said, hey, check this over, make sure that that what I'm saying is is correct, and I just wanted to get a second pair of eyes on it just to make sure that what I was saying was accurate. So I kind of connected with her. We realized that we have a lot in common because some of the progressive Christian writers and authors that I'm researching are people that she has researched because of the influence of the New Age on their ideas. So our research has sort of converged, which is kind of cool. So let's just get right into it. My guest today is Marsha Montenegro, and she has a fascinating backstory. She was a professional astrologer for eight years before becoming a committed Christian. And before before she was even an astrologer, she was involved with various New Age things, the occult, Eastern beliefs and practices, uh, things like inner light consciousness, Tibetan Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, Hindu teachings, meditation and psychic development classes. So during those years, she also participated in things like past life regression, numerology, tarot cards, spirit contact, seances, astral travel, pretty much you name it. And and she has done it and even received a spirit guide through a guided visual, uh, visu- visualization. So through this diversity of friends and uh, astrological clients like witches and pagans, new age healers, psychics, uh, palm readers, card readers, uh, interesting followers of Rajneesh, which there's just been a, a new documentary on that, which is really interesting, and other gurus. So through all these contacts and her own experiences, she's become really, really familiar with just the wide spectrum of beliefs and practices that were just a really intrinsic part of the New Age and occult community. So this will be a really fascinating discussion today. Marsha has her master's in religion from Southern Evangelical Seminary. My heart, I love SES. That's where I took classes. (laughs) So Marsha, it's so great to have you on the show. Thank you so much, Elisa. And I am, I'm looking forward to our discussion. 
Me too. And you have quite a story. And I thought it might be kind of fun if we just take the first few minutes here. Why don't you just walk us through how you went from being a professional astrologer that was practicing all of this stuff that I'm sure many Christians haven't even heard of to becoming a committed Christian. What's your testimony in that sense? Okay. Um, well, I'll give you the somewhat short version. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I was exposed to church growing up, but I was not in a Christian family. My father was an agnostic. My mother was a nominal Southern Baptist, but did think children should go to church. So I was exposed to the Bible in terms of hearing Bible stories in Sunday school and sermons and things like that. But I began to doubt uh, the truth of Christianity. By the time I was, I would say, 14, I started questioning a lot of things, questioning the Bible, which I don't think I ever understood what it meant that the Bible was the Word of God. You know, I didn't really, I didn't know anything about how the Bible got written or anything like that. I, I just, it was just this book that we, we used in church. And I began to question a lot of things. And I had a lot of non-Christian friends uh, in high school who were into their own spiritual path, like one was a Mormon, one was Baha'i. Um, one was, one called herself a free thinker and, uh, another one was very, very much a Quaker, but very strongly into pacifism and they were all devoted to their own beliefs. And I just began questioning more and more why I should think of myself as a Christian and why should, why shouldn't I explore other paths? So that started me on a road Uh, that I continued through college and after college where I was reading about other beliefs. I got very interested in Hinduism in college when I had to do an independent project on Gandhi. And then later after college, when I had more time to explore, I was reading different books about different beliefs. I also had an interest in the paranormal. So I had Mm an interest in other religions, and then this kind of parallel track of interest in the paranormal. And I was interested in contact with the dead and all those things like that, psychic powers. And I did a lot of reading. I also had a few friends in college who were interested in those things, too. And I had always been interested in astrology. I got interested in that in high school and actually went to hear Jean Dixon speak. And she spoke, I think, at the press club down in Washington, D.C., and um, my, my father took me, I think. But I was, I was very intrigued by all of these things because I felt that there was this whole other area of spirituality that I was missing out on. And as I began to read more and get more interested, I started taking classes Uh, And these classes were at a place called the Foundation of Truth. And I was taking classes on psychic development and classes on astrology. I also had explored, uh, before that, I had gone to a Tibetan Buddhist group a few years before that. And they had taught me how to do the meditation And I I didn't stay with that for a real long time, but I was in it for a while, and I was reading the books by the leader of that group, uh, Choygam Trungpa, who died, I think, in 1986. And um, I I just felt like all these new truths were opening up to me, and it was very freeing to me. So I continued along those paths and finally decided to get seriously involved with something that I could use to help other people, and that was astrology. And so I studied astrology, and in the city of Atlanta, they had it set up so that you could uh, practice astrology in the city limits if you had a license, but to qualify for the license, you had to take a test. And so you could either take the test from the American Federation of Astrologers, or you could take the test 
that was given by the Atlanta Board of Astrology Examiners that had been set up by some astrologers several years earlier. And so I took that exam in 1983. It was a seven-hour exam. Wow. It's not easy. (laughs) And uh, about 50% of the people who take it every year that it was given fail. Um, And once you take that and pass, you can then purchase a, a license from the city and practice legally. So that's what I did. And I started practicing astrology and getting clients. At the same time, I was still following the Eastern uh, worldview and the practices of Eastern meditation. And I had I had gone from Tibetan Buddhism into Zen Buddhism. So I was doing Zen Buddhist type meditation, which is now called mindfulness and is now mm-hmm. in the culture as a very uh, popular yeah. thing. <laughs> and interestingly too, Marsha, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the, it's even in children's programming. Like uh, there's a Mickey and the Roadster Racers TV show where there's a whole episode on Goofy doing mindfulness. I I couldn't believe it when I saw it. Yeah. I did a post on that on Facebook. Oh, okay. About, I think it was two, maybe even three years ago. I did a very long post on it. I watched um, the the whole episode and then I made comments every time they had a mindfulness thing come up. Mm. I, I wrote about it, and at which point in the video it came up. And so I, I'll have to find it for you and send you that link. Yeah, that'd be great. We'll post that in the okay. notes because also, you know, if you're listening, Marsha's a great person to follow on Facebook. She posts uh, prolifically. She posts a lot of really great stuff. So, um, but yeah, we'll put links to all that. Uh, but uh, can, sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. Continue. No, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, no, it's good to point that out. And I was very much, my worldview was that everything we see is is really kind of a manifestation of something else. So what you're, the reality that you're seeing and experiencing has a hidden reality to it is probably the best way to put it. And so you, you think all these things mean things, you know, when something happens to you, well, it must be. It must be because of something else, you know, not the obvious Mm -hmm. thing. You know, if you have, if a car runs into you, then what was that a manifestation of? You know, could that be that you had hidden anger or something and it came out through this car accident or could it have been karma? Mm. Because I believe I had believed in reincarnation for a very long time, even before I seriously started getting into all these areas. And so... You start thinking, you know, and analyzing, well, could it be this? This was maybe a karmic thing, or maybe this was a message from the universe that, um, you know, I'm supposed to have another car or something. You know, I'm just giving you these these quick sure. examples, but you start analyzing everything from this totally different worldview. And I believed that God was an impersonal force, and we all came from this force, and we would all go back to this force. And I believe Jesus was this higher spiritual master who was the avatar of the age of Pisces. So he had ushered in the age of Pisces. Each age of a constellation is about 2,000 years long. And so he had ushered in the age of Pisces. So now we were getting to the point where we were beginning to enter the age of Aquarius. Because in the age, the constellation ages of the universe, which is actually the constellation that the North Pole is pointing towards um, due to this wobble on the axis of the Earth, uh, it goes backwards through the zodiac. So it doesn't go forward. So you go from Pisces to Aquarius, which is backwards. And so uh, this whole idea of the age of Aquarius coming was very exciting to me as a New Ager. And I actually did uh, some articles I was writing for some astrological and New Age publications. And I did a series of articles on the age of Aquarius. I did some articles actually on Jesus as the avatar of the age of Pisces. Wow. <laughs> um, so I was really, really into yeah. I mean, this was really my worldview. Yeah, yeah. And I was very hostile to Christianity and did not think that Christians were spiritually open. I felt they were closed and that they were, they believed a certain thing and they were really, really 
uh, fixated on that and unable to see anything else. And so they had a very narrow view of reality and they were at a lower stage of development, spiritual development because of that. And so I was not open at all to any kind of Christian message or anything Christian. Uh, And so uh, what happened was, is that uh, my marriage uh, came to an end. Uh, I had a son and I had been married and that ended. And one of my clients offered me a part-time job in his office. And what he wanted me to do was actually look at the birth data of the employees and and give him insights on the people there based on the birth data. Now, nobody else in the office knew this, of course. This was a, a secret that, you right. know, I, I he gave me a title and I had an office. And I, I guess people really didn't know what I was there for. <laughs> but no one asked me directly, why are you here? So, <laughs> um, And I was still doing my astrology, but that wasn't enough income. And that's why... He, I guess he knew that, and he offered me this this part time job. So I was in this office, and it was during this time that I started getting this very strange urge to go to a church, but I could not understand what why I had that urge because I I didn't want to go to a church, but it was like this compulsion, and it just wouldn't leave me alone. It just it continued. It started in the spring. It went through the summer. I even went to an astrological conference in August in Oregon where I did a couple of workshops and I was surrounded by astrologers and New Agers and Wiccans and um, totally in my element there. Um, I came back to Atlanta, which is a city where I was living, and this, this compulsion to go to a church was still there. So I decided that I would go because I figured it was from a previous life. Mm. And that I needed to get it out of my system. (laughs) So that's how I justified it. And I went to the church and I sat in the back and I picked a church that was fairly large in downtown Atlanta where I was pretty sure nobody would know me. And I sat in the back and the service began and everybody stood up and they had a procession down the aisle from the back led by a young boy carrying a cross And as he walked by me, I felt this overwhelming uh, waterfall of love, as I call it, falling on me from above. It was not the music or the people or anything. It was very external to me and to the place. And I knew that it was from God. And um, it was from a personal God because it was this love that I was feeling from him which completely took me by surprise. I didn't know what to, I didn't know how to process it basically. And I just kind of stood there and I actually had tears coming out of my eyes and I stayed for the whole service. Um, And I actually was planning to leave early, but this happened at the very beginning. (laughs) So I didn't leave. I stayed and then I decided to come the next Sunday And I started going to that church, and I took a class, a Sunday school class. Um, It was an Episcopal church, and I took a class called What Episcopalians Believe. And I would I would offer my own beliefs, you know. I would raise my hand and say, "Well, you know, in Tibetan Buddhism, they believe that when you die." (laughs) (laughs) I bet you were very very fun for them, very entertaining. Well, Episcopalians are very polite. Yeah. yeah. And they would and they would look at me and kind of nod and some of them would smile like, oh, you know, that's very interesting. (laughs) (laughs) And and a few people I got to know asked for my business card. So I thought, well, you know, maybe I can get some clients here. And um, I I continued to go. Plus, I was taking another class in the evenings given by the rector of the parish Uh, for people who were planning to be confirmed. And um, when I found that out, I said, well, I'm not I'm not going to be confirmed in the church. And they said, well, you can still come to the class. And for some reason, I liked the class. I liked it. I liked the small group. Um, I liked listening to this rector, this minister. He was going through the Gospel of Mark. 
But nothing he said made any sense to me. I would just sit there and listen. And it's like I heard all this for the first time. And I guess it's, it intrigued me. I, I don't know how to explain why I kept going, but I kept going. Now, that when I first walked into the church that, that day and had that waterfall of love was Labor Day weekend. So around um, sometime in October, middle or late October, I started getting this impression that God wanted me to stop doing astrology. And um, I'm sorry that astrology was wrong, this impression that astrology was wrong. And I just sort of ignored it. And then into November, it became this very strong impression that God wanted me to stop doing it. going to hit the pause button for just a moment to talk to you about a ministry that I believe in called Impact 360. Just hearing Marsha's story reminds me of all of the ideas that are out there in the world waiting for our kids when they leave the safety and the comfort of our homes and our churches. Impact 360 is dedicated to equipping our kids, not just to interact with these ideas from a biblical worldview, but to also teach them how to live as light in a dark world. They have summer experiences for high schoolers. I got to speak at the Propel Experience last year. I'll be there again next year. If you go to impact360.org slash propel, you can register for next year's Propel Experience. Right now is the early bird pricing. So you're going to get $100 off. But if you use my name as a promo code, that's ALISA, all caps, A-L-I-S-A, you'll get an additional $50 off for a total of $150 off your tuition. I really hope you'll take advantage of this, and I hope to meet your high schooler next year at Propel. Now back to our discussion with Marsha Montenegro. So at this point, at this point, did you believe in in like the Christian God or was that just something you were adding to your? No, not at all. You I just... was still totally new age. I was, I was yeah. totally, I was, I was filtering all this stuff in from the church in a new age manner. Right. I remember even sitting there looking up one time when they had a speaker trying to see his aura. Um, I was, you know, everything was, I was still had the new age Jesus. Right. Which we're going to talk about in a moment. Yeah. I was trying to I was trying to fit it into what I was hearing and doing. But the interesting thing is I did notice when I was getting these impressions, I did notice during this time that during the service, because they do have this set liturgy in that church, and they would read from the Book of Common Prayer. So they would read these things that sometimes were straight from Scripture, and they would also read prayers, you know, and say certain prayers at certain points in the service. And I noticed every time they said the Lord Jesus Christ, it had this effect on wow. me. Um, and I, I didn't know what the effect was, but it was this very strong effect. It was, it just it was, like, it was like it hit me. Somehow it was hitting me and having some kind of a hold on me, but I, I didn't know what it was. I just noticed that I was responding to that phrase, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I was still in my new age mindset, but I, I was aware that, that things were shifting for me, but I didn't understand it. And I, well, I was also resisting it because I didn't want to leave the spiritual path I was on. But this, this, um, this, impression that I should give astrology up was really the turning point because it became so strong that I realized that I had to do it. I even went to the rector to see him about it. And he was very calm. And he opened the Bible and started reading these passages in the Old Testament about divination. And then he told me how they used to read the liver of animals um, you know, to get messages. And I, I was sitting there thinking, why is he telling me about the liver of animals? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I wasn't quite making the connection. Right, right. But after he said all these things, it sort of came to me that what he was telling me is that in the Bible, astrology is not, is not the right thing to do. So I thought, well, I guess I have to give it up. Now, this was my whole career. I mean, this yeah. is my life was was totally wrapped up in astrology. Um, I had just finished being president of the Astrological Society, 
And I had just finished being, I don't think at that point I was, I had been chairperson of the astrology board of examiners, the, the board that gives the exam. So I was totally wrapped up in yeah, that world. And the in. thought of leaving it was just, was overwhelming. But I did. I just made a decision. I had to stop. So this was before and, you were a Christian. Right. Wow. Right. Yeah. I was not a Christian yet. And that's what makes it all the more amazing, I think, to me, that it was I wasn't even a Christian. Yeah. <laughs> it just shows that the, it's the Lord, because what other reason would I, and, you know, unless I had a personal reason to do it, and I didn't, why would I give this up? I had clients, I even had clients from Europe writing me, asking me to do their chart, and I would tape it and then send them a tape. And so um, I... I did. And it was a very strange time for me. And clients would call me and I would have to tell them I'm not doing astrology anymore. And they would say, why? And I would say, well, I don't know why, but it's separating me from God. And they would say, how is it doing that? And I'd say, I don't know. And it was just, it was, it was very, very weird. So I was referring them to other astrologers. I didn't really know what else to do at the time. And then I decided to start reading the Bible, and I started reading the Bible in December. Now, when I gave made the decision to give astrology up was the night before Thanksgiving, so it was in the latter part of November. I started reading the Bible in early December, I think, and I was reading Matthew. I started with Matthew chapter 1, and I just started reading a little bit every night, not really understanding it, but reading it. And when I got to chapter 8, it was about four days before Christmas, and I was reading a passage in chapter 8 where Jesus is on the boat with the disciples, and the storm scares the disciples, and they wake him up, and he rebukes the sea and the wind, and the storm instantly stops. And this this account just um, had an effect on me that caused me to read it again and again several times. And as I was rereading it, my eyes were open and I saw who Jesus was. Like for the first time, I realized who he was. I realized, of course, I had knew the story about Jesus dying on the cross. I didn't really ever understand it. But at this point, I understood what that meant. I understood I was separated from God and that the only way to be reconciled was to turn my life over to Christ. And I, it all just came together and made sense. And so in that moment, I just gave my life to Christ. And that is when I truly became a new creature in Christ. I was definitely born again at that moment. I knew I was different. I knew um, the Holy Spirit was with me. I, it, you know, it just all became clear. Yeah. And it was, it was really overwhelming. But from that point on, of course, my life drastically changed. I got rid of my books eventually. It took me a few weeks. And I was still in that office, in that job, but my boss had taken a leave of absence. And so he wasn't there. But when he came back in January, I had to tell him that I couldn't do the astrology anymore. I couldn't look at the birth data for the employees anymore. And he was very nice about it, and he let me stay on, and he just gave me busy work. Wow. And um, so I was still in that office in April, and there was a Christian, a young Christian man there, and I knew I knew he was a Christian, and he had befriended me. Um, he never he never preached to me or told me astrology was wrong, but. He just kind of befriended me and would ask me questions now and then about what I thought about things. Um, so I, I liked him because he was nice and he would ask for my opinion and I loved giving my opinion. So <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? We yeah, all do. We all love it. You know, see, like, well, Marcia, what do you think of, you know, be like, oh, let me tell you what I think of that, you know? <laughs> well, that's a great, but that's a great thing for Christians to think about, though, you know, when, when you're in your workplace or when we are, as you know, me as a mom, when I'm at playdates or wherever our life is going to end up taking me, what a great 
story to hear that what you liked about this guy was that he took an interest in you. He befriended you. He wanted to know your opinion. And, you know, as of course, you're an apologist as well. And, and as we know, you can get so far with people just by, by showing some genuine care and actually asking some really good questions. You can, as Greg Kokel says, put a little rock in their shoe that way. And, and get them to think about things. So that's, I think that's a great thing to, to point yeah, out there. Yeah, it really is. It really is because because he was like that, and he was just very nice, and I liked him, you know, as a person. I liked him, and um, and because he was interested in me, uh, and, and 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 you know, in this friendship way, and and seemed to want to know my views on things. You know, it was really nice. I I enjoyed being around him. You know, of course, we were mostly working, but. You know, there were times when we would talk, and so I he came into my office. I had gone to him, actually, and told him I'd become a Christian, and um, and he he had not said much. He kind of smiled, and I actually, to this day, don't remember what he said, but later in April, he came to my office, and I said, you know, I can't believe that I'm a Christian. And that only a few months ago, I was an astrologer, and now I'm a Christian. I said, it's so hard for me to believe. And he he kind of smiled, and he said, well, maybe someone was praying for you. I, oh. <laughs> I said, no, I don't know anybody who would pray for me. <laughs> I said, no, I can't think of anybody. And I'm looking at him, and it hits me like, you know, duh, Marsha. And I said, oh, uh-huh. I said, wait, Jeff, were you praying for me? And he said, well, my fellowship group at my church has been praying for you. And he said they had been praying for me the whole previous year. And that is when all those things happened, when I started getting that compulsion to go to the church and all those other things happened. And so um, that was what was going on behind the scenes is this group of uh, a young adult fellowship was praying for me at this church. So that is the story. I, it wasn't really a short version. <laughs> that is so great. No, that's that was that's okay. It's it's so fascinating and and just encouraging too. So let's just where did it where did you go from there? So you you've you've been in this Episcopalian church. Yeah. You've got a Christian friend at work, and somehow you ended up getting a master's in religion from <laughs> SES. So like, just let's just walk us through the rest of that. Did you stay at the Episcopalian church, or, or what happened after that? No, I, oh, I had to leave there. I had a very, very wrenching experience. I went on a retreat. I decided after this, you know, after I became a Christian that I would get confirmed in the church. And so I was in this confirmation class for adults and they were holding a retreat for us up in the mountains of North Georgia. And so it was a really beautiful place. And I went there and they had a bishop or a retired bishop who was giving us some of the classes that were kind of little lectures that we went to. And I went to one and it was just what he said that just it just it just hit me so wrong. You know, it was his view of of, of the Bible and his view of it, it just wasn't it wasn't sitting right with me. And it was like he was saying it was very it was kind of humanistic, kind of like we have to strive to do things. And and they showed this video about a liberation priest in South America who was killed. And, you know, I didn't I wasn't getting anything about Jesus in this, you know, and um, it was kind of like social activism. Yeah. And so it it just it was like a wound. And I broke down and started sobbing almost hysterically in one of these classes. And so everybody left except for like these two women who stayed with me and they were trying to like comfort me or just be with me because I was crying, but I couldn't explain to them why I was crying. And I didn't even know for sure, except I felt like I was not getting spiritually fed and that there was nobody there who knew how to spiritually feed me. And, um, I realized that I I couldn't stay in that church and I couldn't be confirmed. And so I found another church uh, and it was 
it was a little bit better. It still, it was kind of a mixed bag. Mm-hmm. Uh, honestly, it was very much a mixed bag. But the good thing about about the second church I went to is that I made my first Christian friends there. Um, and they had been in the New Age and in the Church of Scientology, as a matter of fact. No kidding. And yeah, they had been in it and had had been saved out of it. And um, they we, we were just immediately on the same page. They totally got where I was coming from because I had a very hard time talking to Christians because, you know, I would tell them I'd been an astrologer and they just, they wouldn't know what to say to me. And so... Um, these people totally understood me, and I, I just became very good friends with them, and I'm, I'm still friends with them. Um, and they helped me a lot. You know, they answered a lot of my questions that I had, uh-huh. and um, all it was just kind of a nice, a nice friendship there that the Lord provided for me at a time when I really, really needed it, some support and information that I needed. And then within a few months, though. Um, I had to leave that job, and the man who had hired me had been transferred out of it, and they were also, there was an economic thing going on, so I was not a regular employee. I had been hired as a contract worker, and they were letting all those people go. So I I didn't have anywhere to go, and I um, wasn't sure about how I could pay the rent, and I had my son to support and so my parents lived up in the Washington, D.C. area, and my mother kept saying, you can come stay here and find a job here. So I ended up going to Washington, D.C. with my son and staying with my parents for a while and getting a job. But from the time I'd been a Christian, I wanted to do something. I wanted to warn people about the New Age. I just felt like it was so imperative, and I wasn't really— I, I wasn't aware. It seemed to me that Christians didn't understand what the New Age was. And so uh, I felt like I need to tell them, you know, but I didn't really have much of a forum. <laughs> I should say in Atlanta, I did come across through these friends I made at this church, a counter cult ministry, which still oh. exists. It's a very large one called Watchman Fellowship. It's a very good ministry. And I met some of the people in that group who were coming over to Atlanta to train people in cult apologetics. That was wow. my introduction to apologetics, was apologetics to cults. And uh, so I got a good dose of it there with that group. Uh, and most of these people in the group had been in cults, although one of the guys had been had been in the New Age. And so I, I got a lot of, of kind of moral support and information from him as well. Well, so after I came up to Washington, there wasn't a group like that. And um, so I just started plunging myself into the Bible and reading the Bible and, and going. Um, I, it took me a while to find a good church. Uh, I was in I was in a church that was uh, was really, uh, really um, not centered on the Bible as God's authoritative word and, and kind of drifting, um, towards more, I hate to use the word liberal, but it, a lot of the, the Baptist churches in Northern Virginia have, have drifted into that. There's not a lot of conservative Southern Baptist churches in in Northern Virginia. And this was, this was one of them. And I could tell by the things that we were, that we were being told that this was, this was not, holding to a real strong sound orthodoxy. So I ended up going searching for other churches and finally found the church that I'm still in. And wow. that's where I really began to grow and, and you know, learn God's word and understand a lot of things that I did not understand. And at the same time, um, the people started asking me to speak. The youth pastor asked me to speak to the youth group. And then he introduced me to other youth pastors, and some of them asked me to speak to their youth groups. And meanwhile, my testimony, I don't know, I can't remember how these people found out about me, but they asked me to write up my testimony in this little publication way out in the wilds of Canada. And I wrote my testimony up, and some church in Connecticut saw it. 
and asked me to come up there and speak on the New Age. And so I did. And after that, it just seemed I, I started getting invitations to speak. But I was working full time in an office and I had a son um, to support and raise. And so I started doing all this speaking on the side. So it was kind of like ministry on the side that I would do. Um, and that led after a few years to the missions pastor talking to me at my church and saying, if you went full time, we could support you more. And I said, well, what do you mean full time? You know, he said, well, you would be, you go with a mission board. And I said, you mean be like a missionary? And he said, yes. And I said, oh no, I could never do that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, (laughs) God had a lot of surprises for me. I know. It's so cool. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and so really that year, um, a lot of things happened that convicted me. I did an outreach at the county fair, which was really eye-opening considering the people that came to my booth. And I had all these occult symbols, and then I had the cross, and I had a one-sentence thing under each one, what it meant, and then I had a brochure. And I mean, people with all kinds of a cult and new age beliefs came to the booth. It was really incredible what the Lord did. And I I realized, okay, this is what God wants me to do. This is why I have this whole past in this area. And so I ended up going uh, with a mission board, Fellowship International Mission, which is still my mission board, and then having to get support from churches and individuals. And so I operate Uh, technically as a missionary, and I live completely on donations, and that started in 1998, so I've been doing that for 20 years. No kidding. And, um, you know, it's really been quite a journey, (laughs) and and, um, I've just seen the Lord do so many amazing things, uh, just not just in how He took care of me, and supplied what I needed, but the doors that he's opened. And that led to, oh, in order to go full time for my church to support me, they told me I would need formal theological training. Mm. And so what they required for me, since I had no training like that, they required me to take 30 hours of seminary. Since I had a college degree already, they said you have to do a postgraduate They didn't require a degree, but they required 30 hours. And I thought, okay, I need to look into this. So I started checking out seminaries. I couldn't really find any that had any kind of program that interested me um, until I saw something about SES, Southern Evangelical Seminary, had something in a magazine about their online program and their degrees and how they were focused on apologetics. And I knew right away that was for me. Yeah. And I had met Dr. Geisler at a conference. I love him. <laughs> oh, I too. I really love him. And um, I had met him and I was so excited about this. And so I decided that's what I would do. I went and talked talk to my pastor about it. And then I ended up enrolling in SES. And I I didn't want to just do 30 hours. I thought, well, if I'm going to do 30 hours, I might as well do a little more and get a degree. Well, Marcia, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your story with us. We're going to continue this conversation next week with part two. We're going to talk more about the specific beliefs in the New Age community and how that is finding its way into the church. So stay tuned for that. Be looking for it next week. enjoyed listening to this podcast, you can sign up to receive my post by email by going to alisachilders.com and clicking the subscribe button or simply subscribe to the Elisa Childers podcast on iTunes.